Um, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where QUT now stands, and to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, the International Law and Global Governance Program is really delighted to co-host this event this evening with Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. The ILGG program, for those of you who don't know about us, um, we're a, a cluster of researchers here at, at the QUT Law Faculty um, exploring issues of, of um, international significance relating to human rights, international security, environmental protection, social justice and all the big issues. Um, so the, the topic for tonight's discussion is, is really interesting to us as <coughs> scholars, but I think perhaps even more so interesting to all of us as citizens of the world, um, and a, a world in which financial institutions seem to have an increasingly strong grip on our daily lives. We're reading about them and all of their misdeeds on a, on a seemingly daily basis. But at the same time, we're, we're also conscious of just how many people in this world are living in poverty, and of the, the failure of trickle-down economics um, to succeed in improving living standards around the world. So against that backdrop, we might very well ask where does human rights fit in to the picture? And we're hopeful that tonight's discussion is going to shed a little bit of light on some of those questions. Our guest speaker this evening is Professor David Kinley, who holds the chair in human rights law at the University of Sydney. David's a highly qualified human rights expert having been the founding director of Monash University's Caston Centre for Human Rights and a founding member of Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, um, who are our proud co-hosts this evening. In addition to his academic expertise, particularly in the area of the global economy and human rights, David also has extensive experience working in practice with governments, international organisations, law firms and NGOs. Tonight, he's going to be drawing on his very recently published book, Necessary Evil, How to Fix Finance by Saving Human Rights, out now through Oxford University Press. Um, tonight, David will be in conversation with Benedict Coyne, who's going to be asking the tough questions and helping us get to the bottom of, of whether, we can, um, whether we can get our financial systems working to achieve good in the world. Benedict is a, a visiting fellow here at the ILGG Research Program, and he's the immediate past president of ALHR. He's got extensive experience as a practitioner of human rights law. You might have seen him on the telly, working in relation to a, a number of high profile cases where he's fought for social justice, indigenous rights and environmental protection. He's currently chair of ALHR's Human Rights Act subcommittee, where he's campaigning to get the Queensland government to honour its commitment to legislate a Human Rights Act here in Queensland. So we're delighted to have both David and Benedict with us this evening. We're looking forward to a, a fascinating and stimulating discussion. There'll be opportunities for questions at the end, but for now, I'll hand over to Benedict and David. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you all for coming uh, today and tonight. And I'd first like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land as well, and their elders past and present, and their future generations. I represent a lot of Indigenous people in various uh, cases against the Adani mine in deaths in custody, etc., etc. And I think it's important to have that uh, recognition. Um, thank you, David, for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, it's an amazing book, and I've devoured and destroyed it, as you can see. Um, I was saying to David, it looks like an 80s day glow dance party after I finished with it. So there's a lot of highlighting uh, throughout that. So just to um, jump right off from the start, and um, there's probably a lot of people who may not have uh, had the pleasure yet of reading the book. Um, it's a terrifically exciting book. I found it very engaging and inspirational and a, a um, very refreshing uh, read of a very dense and, and important and topical subject matter uh, that was very accessible to read and just sent many different thoughts off in, in, in different directions. Um, all of your uh, alliterative articulations were very pleasing to my poetical predilections, and uh, if, you, if you're into alliteration, you're going to love the book. <laughs> Boring banking, fantasy finance, promise and peril, complicated confederacy. He's basically got alliteration for every letter in the alphabet. Um, but, looking, but looking at the extract uh, for tonight, uh, it states that capitalism has been a key force behind, behind human progress for centuries. But as the power of the finance sector has grown, public interests have been sidelined and human rights concerns have been ignored. 
So can you please provide, uh, by way of a first response, a short, succinct summation uh, in a, in a six-minute billable unit, if you can, of why this is the case? <laughs> thank you for that leading question, Felicity. Uh, thank you. May I just say thank you very much for QUT for hosting this and for you uh, being in conversation. I think it's a pleasure for me. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't quite sure it was as much a pleasure when you sent to me early this morning your 17 pages of questions <laughs> <laughs> so that I could have a quick perusal of them on the plane up from Sydney. I thought, good Lord, 17 questions. Is that all of them? Just 17 questions. I will have to be succinct, therefore. I mean, I've got to say that for me, the main impetus for the book was the fact that finance and human rights are two of the most important global forces that we encounter on a daily basis, whether we realize it or not. And I mean that with respect to human rights and finance. If you, as I'm sure you do, dig just a little bit deeper on both of those, you realize how much of your life depends on your education on your health, on your freedom of expression, on the fact that you can move freely and you can come into debates like this, uh, as well as the fact that you are wearing clothes that you're wearing, the phones that you're carrying, the credit cards that you're using, the Uber that you use to get here, all of these, or the bus or whatever, all of these things are financially related. So it did seem to me that it was such an obvious connection that there must be lots written on it. <laughs> In fact, there's not. It's hardly anything. Um, and one of the uh, inspirational moments for me was giving a talk 10 years ago uh, on this very topic, right at the beginning of writing the book, because uh, I'm a slow writer, <laughs> um, at Herbert Smith Freehills in London. And it was hosted by a partner, a finance partner, uh, just a brown paper bag lunch with interested uh, lawyers from the law firm. And he introduced it by saying, in 25 years of him being inside and outside boardrooms, bankers, big firms, big companies, he'd never heard the words human rights and finance put together. Now, it got a laugh, it got a laugh from me, and it got a laugh from all the young, mostly young lawyers in the audience. But I've got to say that's a striking omission, is it not? It's shocking that that should be the case for somebody who spends his life, as he did, in finance. So really, the, for me, the impetus was to try and work out how the two were connected, and also to divine an argument to say that finance needs human rights in order for legitimacy and its validity to be secured, and that human rights need finance in order to achieve all the things that we take for granted in a country like this, or indeed developing countries are beginning to take for granted to lesser extents than, than perhaps they would wish. So it was a two, it was a double pronged effort, not just to lambast finance, um, but to lambast human rights people about their lack of engagement with finance. Because if finance is to be more conducive, more understanding of human rights, uh, then it's got to be told, educated as to what human rights means to finance. And not enough human rights people do that. And it seems that um, <coughs> certainly a revelation for me reading the book is exactly what you said, that these all-pervasive realms of our society, and certainly finance, it kind of underpins and overarches everything that we don't even think about from day to day. And um, something that struck me, and I think it also goes to a previous text that you wrote on the um, economic, social and cultural rights, that perhaps in Western countries we think more about civil and political rights notwithstanding there's arguments about that kind of dichotomy mm -hmm. and there's overlap and whatever else, but they're really, it, you know, I took the lambast for the human rights community, I'm happy to take that, because I think that's absolutely right. And I just think it's amazing the lacuna that this book fills in that regard. Well, it's nice of you to say so, but it, I don't think it fills it. I think it's, I think it's, it's edged into the gap. Um, mm -hmm. And I do really think that there is a gap there. Uh, and you know, one of the most extraordinary coincidences for me was the Royal Commission to occur as it, as it has happened. And I'm sure all of you would agree that, that f well, I hope you will agree, that one of the most extraordinary things about the Royal Commission is the fact that it has articulated in everyday terms the sorts of concerns that we have 
about what finance can and cannot do. Um, many of us think of human rights and finance as being two utterly separate categories, such that finance is Wall Street, it's complicated derivatives, it's the global financial crisis, and possibly you can see how that trickles down to our everyday lives. But when you have a nurse standing up, as she did three weeks ago um, or four weeks ago in Melbourne, and saying that I was given bad financial advice, in fact, almost criminally negligent financial advice, such that my early retirement to set up a little B&B &B, uh, from 55 to 75 and eke out my last working days were destroyed and that I will now have to work until I'm 80 in order to regain the money that I lost. Everyone can relate to that. Everyone in this room can relate to that. So immediately you realise, well, finance and human rights, which is what her, what hers was, uh, the consequence of it, are something that are immediate and every day. Mm. So, I find interesting that writing the book, because it's a, it's a trade book, it's not an academic book, uh, the editor kept saying to me, tone down the human rights man, he was an American, tone down less human rights. <laughs> and what, what he meant was not human rights, what he meant was the use of the word human rights, and indeed particularly international human rights law. What he meant was, and I think it was a tremendous education for me, was talk about it in everyday terms, the fact that women have to feed their children, men um, uh, have to look after their children, uh, men and women have to relate to each other on an everyday basis, jobs have got to be found, um, health has got to be pursued, whether it's through a public health care system or a private health care system, everyday occurrences, whether it's in rich countries or in poor countries. And so, in a way, that makes you translate international human rights law into everyday good life scenarios, where you try and lead a life that is as secure, dignified, happy, safe as possible, which is really what human rights are all about. Absolutely. And I think one thing I certainly struggle with as an advocate um, day to day is bridging that gap, um, even with politicians. And so using the terminology, and I've had, been having this conversation quite frequently recently, that the term itself, human rights, has become an abstraction of sorts and people glaze over and, you know, it's become a target of the right and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And I was at um, <coughs> International Business, um, no, sorry, International Bar Association, International Business and Human Rights training a couple of weeks ago in Melbourne and they had a um, keynote speaker from um, Conic and Minolta, the big printing company, and they've jumped out in front of the market in terms of the Modern Slavery Act coming in and also the Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And she was telling all these kind of feel-good, great anecdotes about how it's worked for them. And it's opened up many doors with big banks, in fact, who want to learn about what they're doing, not necessarily business, but relationships and what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of going into their supply chains, which is very complex, they don't use human rights because people don't understand that in those different industries. And so they've had to get those concepts of the good life, of the right thing to do, mm. that kind of thing in order to translate those terms. And I think that's the ever-present challenge, mm. um, not talking about international human rights law instruments mm. that might be relevant here, there or everywhere, mm. but talking about the clothes on your back, uh, you know, noticing homeless people in the streets mm. increasing, um, noticing, um, you know, all of these various different factors. And one of the other revelations a, a, a bit like kind of taking is it the red pill or the blue pill when you kind of just look at the world anew in terms of finance being ever present and everywhere and the quantity of finance just being I think you use the term um, eye watering in terms of how overwhelming uh, that it is but um, looking at taxation as a channel or facilitator of really amazing human rights protections that we don't I mean, people bemoan taxation because it's just become a thing. It's become a political football hooligan, you know, target constantly. But people, I, I, it made me kind of think about it in a different way, perhaps appreciate it more as a celebration of the commonwealth, literally. Well, I, I'd say in the book, one of the chapters that deals with taxation, that uh, of all people, a jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, uh, coined the phrase that, that taxation is the price that we pay for civilization. Um, he was speaking immediately before um, uh, Roosevelt's uh, Four Freedoms came in and the idea of a welfare state was born in the US. Uh, and that is indeed, I think, what he is alluding to. He was just old enough, or just 
lived long enough to see those um, uh, the Roosevelt New Deal come in. Uh, but taxation is an important part of what we see as our social contract. It is part of what helps us enjoy all the things that makes Brisbane such a livable city for rich and for poor. So of course we should be contributing to that. And that means the rich, as well as the medium rich, and usually not, should not be the poor. Although regressive taxation means that even the poor will pay uh, value-added tax and, and uh, consumption taxes. Um, but really the question is, how is that tax raised? And what are the roles played by financiers? Because I think one of the greatest problems that we are facing now, and this is a relatively new problem in the sense of it being understood, is how much banks and their lawyers and accountants are facilitating tax avoidance and tax evasion. The two are often seen, of course, legally in places like this August Law School are seen as different. Of course they are. One is illegal, one is not. But there's a, there's a, a very interesting economist in, in the US called Danny Kaufman who talks about tax uh, avoidance as being a legal corruption. In other words, it is legal, but it is in effect immoral or unethical. One of the things um, in that chapter I think you're alluding to, um, Starbucks uh, pays an effective tax rate on its profits in the United Kingdom of 0.29%. So less than 1% it pays because it can ship it offshore, its profits offshore, into Netherlands and Irish bank accounts. Google does the same, all the big companies. Are, and this is legal. And as I say in the book, it's absolutely rational. It's, it's what I would do, and indeed the sorts of uh, lawyers that are educated by places like this and then my university are meant to do. They're tax mm. efficient. So they say to their clients, this is the way to minimize tax. It's not illegal, but it is efficient. Now, how can that be so? That seems a, a, a violation, an abomination of a moral obligation. In fact, Starbucks reacted to this by saying, oh, we'll pump in 200 million, as if it was just a quick donation, 200 million to show our bona fides. Yeah, but what about paying what would be the effective tax rate that you think would be appropriate? 15%, 25%, but not 0.2%. So it's, it, this is a major problem. I say it's relatively recent because this sort of stuff was not known or not appreciated. The fact that you can transfer payments, uh, you, can, you can, within a company, use your uh, globalized capacity to put your profits in places that charge extremely low or no tax, and all your costs in those parts of the world that charge high tax, so you can get good re rebates from them and pay no tax in the others. This is rational, mm. but it's also depriving, particularly the poorer countries, of what would be their, their appropriate and um, morally based gains. And it's like, like I mean, it, it comes to mind the frustration of sovereignty, frustrating the, uh, the means and concepts of international human rights law, which is kind of ironic in some ways that um, the growth of these companies into, into jurisdictional entities means that they can get away with that. I think in Australia there were some 500 uh, multinational companies that you know, pay uh, no tax, and it comes back to a central thing that I certainly picked up from the book about um, you know, finance uh, and financial systems becoming no longer a means to an end, as in money, as you say, that the, the provision of services, the use of exchange coming from barter systems and looking at the history of it. Very interesting part that I found, having you know, grown up a Catholic and a Christian and looking at the Roman rule against usury back in the day and looking at the Islamic banking system that actually outlaws interest uh, because it is abusive, effectively. And look at the way our systems are structured these days. Like right? All of that's gone out the window and then you have these, this attitude. I mean, you go to cultural change in the kind of hopeful end notes of the book um, and, it, and it kind of weaves its way through. But the, um, the kind of lack of integrity in the system such that financiers now see themselves as an unanswerable end of a means, as opposed to facilitating a means to other ends. Well, I, this is a product of political power. Uh, finance has hijacked our governments, and this sounds like a real sort of conspiracy theory. I, I don't mean it to sound like that, but I do mean to say that that is what's happened. It's no accident. Um, from the 1980s onwards, with the 
Big Bang in the city of London and in Wall Street. There was a deregulation, it actually was a re-regulation, but anyway, a deregulation of banking and finance, such that it was A, able to create many more and different so-called exotic products that could be sold to everyone, to us as well as to institutional investors, but B, and most importantly, it allowed um, banks and us to leverage, to borrow far more than we actually need, uh, but we want it, we think we need it, and as a consequence, therefore, we've become, we individuals, citizens, and our governments have become beholden to finance. So it's, it's not just as if there was some sort of devil within finance that said, I will infect the minds of all of you and of the government. But we, in effect, have invited it in. John Clark and, and Daw have this wonderful piece, I, I show it to my students all the time, those two-minute clips, in which he describes what banking means. And in effect, they say, it boils down to this, that you don't need to be able to pay back the money that you borrow. You just need to be, be able to pay back the interest on the money that you borrow. <laughs> and that's all. And you just delay everything else and somebody else will deal with it, whether it's your grandchildren or your great-great-grandchildren, but it will somebody else will deal with it. So we've, we've binged on, 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 on the capacity to borrow way beyond what our parents and grandparents could, could, mm. could, uh, could believe was possible. So the exceptionalism that finance, the special circumstance that it finds itself in, is because we have fed it, we've wanted this leverage. They have got to leverage themselves in order to provide us with the amount of borrowing that we have taken on, and let alone all the corporations as well. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, governments are either timid or simply unwilling to curb the beast, because if they mix my metaphors, if they, if they kill or damage or ail the golden goose, then the eggs will no longer be laid. So the feeling goes. Hence, in the global financial crisis, they save the banks in order to save the system. Or the golden goose or the Goldman Sachs. Or the Goldman Sachs. Um, of our political revolving doors, perhaps. Um, just jumping back to that point about, you know, law schools training lawyers to then go into these positions and facilitate this kind of oiling the wheels of capitalism or the cogs of capitalism to be alliterative and, um, and facilitating this kind of gap between a, a, a moral obligation of a social contract and you know, what is legally acceptable. Um, and looking at international human rights or, or just human rights law um, as bridging that gap to some degree. I think it's really interesting in this space that we exist now with the guiding principles on business and human rights which were developed in such an amazingly consultative way by a non-lawyer, professor of economics from um, Harvard, John Ruggie. And because he wasn't a lawyer, that story is really interesting, the way that he approached it, the way that he did it. But he's feeding straight into the legal industry now. I've been running a case for an uh, Adrian Burrogover of the one Jack Lingu people against the Adani mine, and that is a very difficult uh, case to litigate in the legal strictures of Australian law but they've been getting creative with their campaign. So he trotted off to Europe and to the United States and met with all the major banks and said to them, this is my, um, this is my sovereignty, this is my self-determination. There's no free prior informed consent. Um, there's all these international human rights standards. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna invest in this mine? Now, a lot of those banks and a, a lot of those major banks, um, being Bank of America, a number of French banks, Spanish banks, etc who you would usually see investing in those sorts of projects, a number of them came out on the public record and said, we're not funding this. Well, most of them, well, all of them came out and said, we're not funding it. I think it was 28 in the end. But a number of them came out and said, we're not funding it because we have endorsed the guiding principles on business and human rights. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but it's good marketing. But is that going to change everything with the lawyers who are in the banks and obviously the, the, the aftermarket Royal Commission, all those kinds of things, when they have those non-binding standards that might influence the way they advise well, their clients? I've got to say, I'm, I'm much more jaded about the attitude of banks when they say things like that. They've done it because they've been exposed. Um, mm. There's a public arena. They don't want to be associated with this. They can pull out, and it's not as if they're going to lose a lot of money from this. They lose a lot more in terms of the reputation they stay in. Mm. I'm critical of the, uh, certainly in the financial sphere, I'm critical of the uh, guiding principles, principally because banks have shown themselves 
at least thus far, to be very willing and happy to tick boxes in order to get the monkey off their back, rather than to really change attitudes. Let me give you an example. Um, one of the most horrendous north-south rich country to poor country financial uh, skullduggery stories that I unearthed, or many have unearthed, it's just not me, but I, I talk about it, is this idea of vulture funds or distressed debt, where poor countries have taken on board large debts, either from other countries, from sovereign uh, countries, or from private sector banks, Deutsche Bank, Citibank, whoever else. They've been taken on by previous regimes, they're often known as odious debt, previous regimes which were not themselves legitimate, were authoritarian, were dictatorial. Then, a future generation, maybe a democratic or questionably democratic, but a future generation has to pick up the tab to pay for those debts which often didn't go to the people at all, but went straight into the pockets of people like Sahato and all the other death plots. The Jubilee 2000 campaign was a public sector campaign, that is, the World Bank, all the development banks within the European sector and Australia, forgiving debt. So the debt that was taken on by these poor countries being forgiven by the Western states, but not the private sector. The private sector banks didn't. So in other words, they are still aware, still seeking not only the capital, not only the interest rates, but the capital return. So what they do when eventually they realize they're not going to get this money at all, becomes distressed debt, becomes a, a non-debt. They sell it on to vulture funds who have a specific and, and particular aim, which is to get as much of that debt back possible by going after all the assets of the poor country in other parts of the world through the banks. Now, there is a response. It's a long, complicated story. I appreciate both in the book and here talking to you this evening. But the point in all of this is the banks are doing this with some degree, with some recognition that they're passing on the debt to somebody who's going to pursue it against the poorest countries, the most dysfunctional, the most badly managed and governed countries on earth. Now, is there a responsibility there? They'd say, well, no, it's just business. My contention and the contention I make constantly throughout the book is that this idea that you can put your head in the sand and say it's not our responsibility because that's politics is simply nonsense. Banks are involved in politics all the time uh, for their good. Uh, when they say they want to be deregulated or unregulated, that's fine when they're rich, when they're doing well, but when the global financial crisis comes along and they need to be bailed out, then they want regulation, then they want the state to come in. So there's got to be a recognition of the consequences of your actions, whether you are a politician, whether you're a BHP, or whether you're a city bank. And at the moment, the latter of those in particular, the banks, have not picked that up yet. I think they might, after what we're seeing mm. in Melbourne, but. They're only on the edge at the moment. So, but then in the Adani or climate change examples, when they're exposed, as you said, why not on the vulture funds when they're exposed? So why not using the guiding principles as a platform for advocacy too? Or, or, but even in the Jubilee campaign, they were exposed, but they just refused to do... Well, I, I, let, me, let me say that I think that the, just on the, on the guiding principles, I think they're an important first step. My, my, my concern with them is that they'll be seen as first and final step tick and no more. So there'll be no change in attitude. It'll be, we can veneer this, we can fig leaf this, and we move on. And, and I think that we're seeing some of the results of that fig leaf not changing just on the veneer with the World Commission at the moment. Um, sorry, I forgot your other point. What was your other point? Um, so talking about why the expose of climate change has affected them to the point where they're like, oh no, we're not going to do that. Because you think they've done the balance sheets and gone, oh, we're going to lose more reputation. They just kind of do a cost-benefit analysis. Well, I mean, the, the, it can re lead to regulatory change. Just on the vulture funds, for instance, Britain has effectively outlawed bunch of vulture funds, so you cannot pursue a poor country's assets in the United Kingdom jurisdiction. It's a rather complicated way in which they've done it. But in effect, a vulture fund cannot sue for assets held in Britain, like, for instance, the embassy of Niger. Uh, but you can in the United States, so you can still use the US jurisdiction for these sorts of vulture funds. Mm -hmm. So the point in all of this is that the regulatory response can be one that will pull back on what would otherwise be seen as financially immoral. So regulation can be part of the issue, can be part of the solution. But the biggest solution, the one that I know is difficult, but I think you have to pin hope on this, 
is change from within banking itself. It means leadership. It means the young who are coming out of law school and business schools at the moment, going into the four big banks in Australia, for instance, scarred with this expose that we're seeing at the moment, and seeking real change. Now, I agree, when people sort of scoff at that thing, yeah, I do, I think that myself. But equally, if you don't have that faith that that can happen from within, you're not going to be able to change the banks from without because they still have that political power. You need a reinvention of banking, even if it's slow and generational, it needs to come. And there are some signs of it. And, and, and I was going to come to the conclusion of the book where you talk about empathy, you talk about esteem, you talk about a cultural change in that regard. And, it, and when I was reading the book, and I thought I've been having a lot recently, I guess engaging with um, a lot of different people in different jurisdictions and in different countries, it just struck me one day of, of why is there this kind of delicate sprinkling of people who care about human rights and the environment across the world, and then there's equally, you know, kind of narcissistic sociopaths that want to destroy everything. It's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. They're not all concentrated in one spot, and so all these kind of formative developmental mm. areas. And I was reading a, um, a article on psychology, or a number of articles on psychology today about where empathy is born in the, in, in the human brain. Um, and it's actually kind of housed quite kind of centrally in there. And those articles talk about what kind of formative experiences or just general experiences will um, nurture someone's ability to put themselves in someone else's shoes well, and that kind of thing. I mean, but I mean, I, I mean, it's difficult when you think an, an, an entrenched culture that you know disembodies humans to the extent that they think about numbers and transactions a lot and they probably just get completely desensitised to what it means. Yeah. If a vulture fund's doing this, that and that, who cares because on my you know, balance sheet it needs to be coming up with this and that yeah. and I'll get my bonuses at the end of the year. Yeah. So I, I, I think I see um, increasingly robust political will is needed as well as everything that you're saying to come from the entire well, time. I, to I think there's no doubt about that. It needs to be both. It needs to be the regulatory, so the political leadership has got to take responsibility for this. I, and I mean not only for pulling us out of the mire, but also to recognise that for instance with the global financial crisis it was not just because the financiers themselves were bad bastards but, but, but because the gatekeepers in the regulatory form, the SEC, the United States, the ASIC here did not control or not control sufficiently what banks were doing. They were neutered to a degree but they were neutered because the legal system had been doctored in a way to make them neutered. The number of people that have been prosecuted post the global financial crisis personally have been almost none. After the savings and loan crisis, which is in the 1980s, there were thousands. Now, what happened in between? Criminal law was devalued, or the, the level of what was mens rea, what was guilty, was raised so that it was very difficult to be able to prove that the actions, fraudulent though they would have been in both circumstances, would be negligent or would be criminal negligence or fraudulent now, where they would have been before. Now, that sort of thing has happened incrementally. But it has been there because finance has said, well, we can open this up, we can make the pie as big as possible if you deregulate, if you pull us away from this sort of circumstance. Sort of everyone can gain. It may mean that we gain hugely and you guys get a trickle, but you get a trickle. At least you get a trickle. Isn't that okay? I mean, they don't say that, but that's what the meaning is. Mm. And, you know, that sort of trickle is, is there and it's potent enough. Um, one of the things that I said at the beginning of the book is, Finance, and it's not the only reason, but finance has helped take this world from 1980, when nearly 50% of humanity lived in abject poverty, 50% to a position where it's 10% today. Even more dramatically, the, in China, in 1980, 90% of people, 90% of people lived in abject poverty, what the World Bank says is $1.9 a day. Now it's less than 2%. Now, China has got all sorts of human rights problems, but in terms of getting people out of abject poverty, where they, couldn't, they didn't have enough to eat, didn't have enough to wear, to a position today where that is not the case, and it is only for 2%, is a huge 
financial achievement. But it's come through trickle down because the, the number of rich, uh, indeed the billionaires now in China, outnumber the billionaires in the United States, has, has, it's come at the expense of some being extremely rich and others being less poor than they were. Mm. Um, just going back to your point about um, you know, the fig leaf cover, the kind of cynical PR uh, uh, positions of, of, of the sector, um, obviously never really wanting to get into that much trouble that they actually have to really substantively change things. So, I mean, for you, is, is, is that what's happening down at the, in, at, at, at the commission? Is it just a tick and flick, we're going to roll some people under the bus? Because one of the amazing things about it is just how candidly a face is put to this kind of faceless, you know, monstrosity of decision making that is just so heinously abhorrent mm. that it's hard to kind of un un understand that it's just become a kind of pervasive culture and it's just happening all the time. And you, and you see that. But for you, is it, um, is it something like a... And, and, and if you're watching, watching the commission on the live stream, I, I, I wonder whether for you, uh, David Kinley, who's done a lot of work in this area, whether it's like binge watching a bloodbath of hand-wringing, hair-raising, hand maintenance tales on Netflix, or more like a yawnful rerun of Neighbours, um, where the popcorn is rarely popping anymore and it's just so predictable that they're kind of going through the motions and saying, yes, yes, this happened, that happened, whatever. But because of the, the nature of, of, of what is unregulated, and you do talk a lot about human nature um, and its, its predispositions to greed and those kinds of things, which aren't necessarily bad. They, they keep us functioning, they keep us working, they keep the market going, but they do need to be kept under wraps. So is, is, is it just gonna shift again? And are we in a situation where the regular, the reg, you know, the bankers are at the top. We've got, we've got Mr. Goldman Sachs as Prime Minister now. Um, is, it, is, it, is it possible to, to, to kind of re-regulate where there's been deregulation? Well, I, if you're a human rights lawyer, you've got to be an optimist. Um, I, I do believe that human nature can and does change. In fact, let's be a little more subtle about that. Human nature is both selfish and altruistic. I think that's in all of us, and I think the constant battle is between our altruistic self and our selfish self. What I think determines which wins on any particular day, in any particular moment, in any particular year, is the context in which we find ourselves. And if the context is one in which it is okay to do whatever it takes, it is okay to, because you're told that the incentive, the goal that you are to achieve is to get as many accounts as possible, which means that you bill the debt or you put money into kids' accounts just in order to keep the account going, then that's rationally what you'll do. That's the context in which you will achieve that at, at that level of status. You will measure yourself against those around you and how they're measured. And if they're measured by being the meanest bastard in the in the in the in the pit, then that's what you'll do in order to be to have that accolade. So I talk about esteem in the book, and if you change the levels of esteem, if you change the way in which people are measured, then you can change the way in which they will they will measure themselves, they want to look at themselves in the mirror in the morning, you would like to think, and think what I'm doing is not only successful within the business, it also makes me feel good, rather than thinking, I don't want to say to anyone that I'm a banker, which I think is more to the case now. The number of people I've met, especially when they know that I've written this, who say to me, oh, oh yeah, no, I, I work for a bank. And, you know, and I think, well, good and bad, good that they're admitting it, bad that we've got to a point where banking is seen not as a pillar of society, but it's something scurrilous when, you know, to be ashamed. And what, what a disaster that is for our economy and for our society. Banking is seen as something that undermines social morality. That, that's a huge problem. It, it, it strikes me um, as an idea in, in terms of political leadership, perhaps, that the idea of selfishness can also be contextualised. So I can be a small s limited selfish as in myself, or I can be selfish in terms of my family and my, you know, nepotistic kind of connections and that kind of stuff. I could be selfish in terms of my community. So expanding the sense of the self and, and perhaps there's some lessons to be learned across cultural uh, divisions and, you know, in, 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 in indigeneity perhaps and those other things. And, but, but then also, and, and so perhaps going on the kind of tribal ideas of like, this is good for the Commonwealth and back to the idea of what I was saying about, you know, 
um, re-esteeming taxation, that people are proud to pay their tax mm -hmm. and they feel good about it mm -hmm. and that provides for all of us. But then also looking at patriotism in a positive way, not as in a mm -hmm. um, kind of re retrograde mm -hmm. kind of um, fortress Australia mm -hmm. patriotism, but more of a inclusivity. Um, and I also just want to mention and jump to, I mean, I think it was reading the Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus and, um, and the Sapiens books and those really interesting concepts about really flipping um, commonly accepted ideas on their heads that really are central tenets of our society. And so going to neoliberalism and this whole idea of individualism, and I remember this, perhaps it was in a talk or something that I watched, but just talking about the mythology of individualism. <laughs> so we all sold this... Um, you know, golden beacon on, 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 on the hill or the White House or the land of opportunity or the home of the brave, land of the free, all these kinds of things, and I made it and you too can make it and, and you've got to, you know, work hard for your opportunity, etc., etc. and that's all well and good. But when I get out of bed in the morning and I walk out on my front footpath, there's a bunch of people who made that footpath that I'll never know. And all of the cooperation that humanity has undergone to build the bus that I'm going to get on to get to work in 15 minutes so that I can work on a computer that some other faceless person made, etc. Et so it's amazing how that mythology of individualism has got so much traction that has kind of led to this kind of toxic capitalism. So I think there can be very positive versions of capitalism, but a toxic capitalism that's a very small self centered yeah. degree. I, you know, we're not. Miltonian Islands, you know, we are, we are part of society, we, and we can recognise that, we do recognise that, but if the environment in which we work or live is one that extols the virtue of the individual who gets ahead, irrespective of whose face they stand on, or, or maybe more to the point, you don't think about whose face you stood on, not that you would condone it then that's the way in which we will pursue. The more that we seek to say that you are rewarded, that it is good, that it is not seen as odd, but in fact central, of course, that you like the idea that you work together as a society, the more I think people act as a society. I mean, I'm not saying the Nordics are perfect, mm. but there is definitely that feeling within Scandinavian countries. There used to be in in the Netherlands as well, maybe a little less or not, but still, generally, mm. of that sense of community that, and, and success. I mean, they've got plenty of successful corporations and individuals there as well. The very fact that it's seen as a, as a source of derision for many neoliberal Americans and Europeans is itself an indication of how successful it is. Oh, we don't want to be like that. Well, I think you could do well mm. if you were a bit more like that. Mm. Absolutely. And, and just noting the, 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 the mention of you know, neoliberalism as well, I mean, that mythology has been really exposed internationally. And it's amazing, it, you know, it had this very vibrant and um, amplified life. But even the IMF wrote that report, I think, April 2016, coming out and just saying the, 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 the math of the equation of neoliberalism just doesn't add up. Because if you look at all the examples around, However, then we have um, the editor at large of the Australian, Paul Kelly, in April this year, writing that you know of the progressives, they still bemoan the victory of neoliberalism in this country, and we know, and we know who he's writing for. But it, it 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 doesn't seem to me to be strategically prudent for any ideology to be backing something that even its architects are now kind of questioning and saying it it it, it doesn't have the um, it, the proof is not in the pudding or the pie. See, I think you can have your cake and eat it. You know, I do think that you can be wealthy, individuals can be rewarded. And as you said earlier, I mean, I have this chapter on greed. I, I don't see greed as necessarily a bad thing. Greed for love, greed for your children, greed for uh, ambition, greed for success. But it's a question of what the consequences are of feeding that greed. Um, we should all have it. I think it's what gets us up in the morning. But you, to ignore what the consequences are of your actions in pursuing your greedy ends is itself the problem. So the more that we recognize this in society, the more finance and other sectors of our economy and, and indeed other sectors of our, our society uh, aren't able to use this as an, as an excuse. Oh, it's about greed, so therefore it's good, uh, to use the Wall Street term. And therefore we can do anything in, in its justification. Um, 
there's a, an interesting experiment, again, which I talk about in the book, which tries to, behavioural economists try to identify whether banking creates cheats or whether it attracts them. Um, and it's like this coin tossing experiment and they split people into two groups. Some of you may have seen this, I wrote about it a bit in the, in the Morning Herald a while back. But the bottom line was that those who are thinking thoughts about home and pizza and state of origin tend not to cheat. And so when they toss a coin and they're going to get a reward for every head, they don't lie. They say they get five heads, five tails out of the ten. But those who are primed beforehand to think about banking and their KPIs and their competitive advantage and whatever else, many of them cheated. A, really, a significantly larger number, statistically deviation of, that was a significant, more cheat. And in fact, when they looked at groups, more of them cheated in banking than came out of prisons, which was quite extraordinary. <laughs> So when they asked prisoners to do this, they were fairer than bankers. So uh, there is a problem with environment, uh, and that little experiment demonstrates how environment can make us more selfish, even if there's altruism within us. Mm. Um, jumping to environments and formative environments, I, I think we'll go to the floor in a second if people want to get their questions ready, but I am really interested, um, and I, and I have also have a vested interest for asking this question, but so you're now a professor, a, an internationally renowned professor of, law, of human rights law, international human rights law, business and human rights. You're an academic expert with our uh, Jeffrey Robertson, our exiled Antipodean over in, uh, in, in, in London. And you've had this marvellous career, um, all obviously starting off from being a volunteer of Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. So uh, anyone who wants to join, please feel free. Um, but um, what, and, and, and this really goes to the the, the idea I was talking about before, like this sprinkling of people that care about matters bigger than themselves or want to make a difference in the world. Like, why aren't we all programmed in that way? And why were you programmed in that way to do the work that you've done and, and, and I guess instructive perhaps for some young practitioners here who have an interest? What, um, yeah, just a little bit about your background and what inspired you to want to, oh, yeah, want to work in the area? It's still got, I mean, I, I, Make it sound as if some sort of saintly profession. It's not at all. I'm as selfish or as idiotic as any other uh, person. <laughs> Certainly, my, my children will attest to that. I can tell you. Um, but if I had if I had advice, it, it it would be that you should have courage of your convictions. I don't think I did. Certainly, when I was younger. Um, it seemed, uh, and this is something that still dogs me, and in fact it's one, it must be one of the reasons for the book, is that when I was starting out in human rights, uh, sort of as a profession, when I was doing a PhD, um, it seemed that if you wanted to do human rights, you couldn't and shouldn't make money, that you should be impoverished, that you should wear open-toed sandals with socks, um, that, you, that you could never make money out of it. And not that I'm saying that you should make millions, but that it's not a noble profession without it being um, uh, sackcloth and ashes. Now, this may seem a very sort of materialistic perspective to take, but why I say that is because that is part of the thinking that still pervades, to an extent, human rights in terms of finance, which means it's dirty, it's filthy, it's lucre, don't touch it, hate it, even though Everyone in this room, by the fact that you're in this room, has benefited in some way from finance. And where I think it really is problematic is that we have allowed, therefore, the financiers, the neoliberals, the individualists, extreme, uber-individualists, maybe literally as well as uber <laughs> to, to hold the fort. Mm. And therefore, we're not part of the game. We don't have a table, we don't have a place at the table. They dismiss us. They dismiss human rights. I, I take Robert Schiller to task in here, who's probably one of the most in environmentally and, and human rights engaged uh, economists, a Nobel Prize uh, winner, who simply does not understand human rights. He makes the most extraordinary statements about human rights, including that human rights is unrealistic because it doesn't bend to the needs of finance. What? Mm. Robert, it's exactly the other way around. How could you not know that? Mm. And the reason why Schiller, who I think is a good man, at least I think he's a good man, I don't know, he writes like he is, is in that position because human rights folk have not been able to persuade him or indeed even engage with him 
on his terms, on finance, on the way in which he might relate to it, because all we do is stand on the outside of the car. So I think we've got to get engaged with finance, whether that means you don't wear open toe sandals or not is irrelevant, but you've got to engage with it and thereby be able to educate, as well as to learn how, what, and what, what finance can do and what it cannot do. But that, to me, would be the message, that don't feel that there's anything off limits for your human rights uh, genre. Uh, I think that's less so today. I've met some people today who are off into all sorts of directions in human rights which would never have been countenanced in my time. So I think there is a change there. So that would be my suggestions. Get into any aspect of our society or economy and find the human rights angle to it because there's one there. Mm. But I'm going to pin you down because you didn't answer my question. So what was it <laughs> in, your, in, your, in, your, in your youth, in your past life, in your whatever it was, that really kind of triggered your interest um, that made you do the PhD that you did? I mean, what PhD did you do? Was it but when you did an undergraduate studies or had you thought about it you know, prior to, were you a member of Amnesty International when you were 10 years old writing that <laughs> political prisoners? I mean, what was... No, I, I think it's much more simple and I think that it, it's something that all of you would relate to. It was just one's upbringing. I, I was born and brought up in Belfast during the worst years of, of the Troubles. Um, I, I went to school in Ireland, and, and I was, was thinking, well, what, what is all this about? What, why is this happening in Northern Ireland? What are, why are people hating the way they hate, and, and how can that be so? Um, and it made you investigate what the problems were, what the real problems were, what is worth fighting for, what is not. I've got to say, it also taught me humour, and the importance of humour, not that I would suggest I'm particularly humorous, but that humour is a very important part of keeping one's perspective, and indeed allowing one to be able to engage with the other side as well. I mean, uh, humour I mean in the broadest sense. But I would think that Belfast, um, trying to work out why there was this extraordinary division based principally on Catholic Protestant grounds, but in fact on constitutional grounds, why it was there. Um, also, you know, I couldn't think of anything else to do. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And nobody yeah. else was doing a PhD. So <laughs> no, I just did one. And life has really changed now. You know, there yeah. Hundreds of people were doing PhDs there, but at the time I was there, nobody was. And um, just going back to the point you mentioned before about uh, giving advice to people to kind of not silo themselves mm. and, and really bridge both worlds. And you mentioned a colleague of yours that's been doing that for the last 20 years. Mm. I, I forget her name, but she's quite prominent in finance and also has really been pushing that human rights agenda. Have you seen more of a proliferation on that or not necessarily? Yeah, Mary Dowell Jones, who's now working yeah. for the Bank of England. Um, I, uh, no, a little bit more. I mean, one of my favorite things of saying to students, and I st I'm still amazed that they find it shocking, uh, is I say to them, especially my human rights class, so my fifth year, final year, they're just about to leave the law school. And I say, don't all go and work for the UN or Amnesty International. Some of you definitely do. But please, some of you go and work for the big end of time and stay there. Don't just do your five years or now, now you, it's about one year and get the itch and leave. Stay there. Be in the big end of time. Be part of a law firm, one of the Golden Circle law firms that then is advising these banks that's working right now. Because let me tell you that... Those four banks have engaged just about every law firm in the whole of Australia at the moment. Be part of that negotiation and that discussion. Because if you're not, you're leaving it to the field mm. that believe that there's another way forward. You be one of the ones that brings along a little bit of that sensibility. You're, if you're in human rights in your final year, it's probably because you care and you're bright enough not to have to do commercial or any of the other roles. <laughs> Do it, therefore. Go out there. You'll be able to get the job. Mm. And get in. Some of you stay in the big end of time because that's the way matters will change, mm. not only from the outside. Yes. Brilliant. Well, and while we're on that topic, I want to go to the uh, GR hypothetical, Jeffrey Robertson hypothetical part of the talk, uh, Kinley's Keen-Eyed Financial Advice section. And I thought that I might put to you, I've read your book, and this, this probably follows on a little bit from the last question, I've had a number of aha enlightenment moments. I now realise the most powerful way to positively impact human rights is to get out of litigation I mean, and follow the well-heeled hop, step and jump to the top is to become a barrister for a little bit and then bounce over to investment banking, perhaps say a managing director of Goldman Sachs and then maybe lob into the lodges PM for a bit of early retirement. 
what is your career and or financial and or taxation advice to me? And, and I guess to give you a little bit more um, context, you know, how much, I guess from time to time I lament litigation as being this very reactive space. Um, you're looking at things that happened, you're trying to get recompense, you're not really kind of envisioning things that maybe you could. I mean, you might run test cases and you might get wins and then the government might change laws and you might be back where you start and you might win the battle but lose the war. Uh, you're an ambitious person. Uh, but it, so don't over, as a way, don't lambast yourself uh, because do what I think what you're doing is like all of us is part of the big picture. You can't do the whole picture. You can dance around if you want, and I think your predilection may be that you will dance around all of them. But if you stick to litigation, like for instance, um, we were talking about this earlier, Lee Day, which is a big company uh, now, a big law firm, plaintiff law firm in the United States, in the United Kingdom, started out with just two people. Now it's this major affair with uh, about 30 partners, uh, brings in a lot of business, and every lawyer coming out of law school in the United Kingdom and elsewhere wants to work for them. So litigation definitely can have a really powerful part to play. I, I would suggest a lot more powerful than, than books. But whatever, both have a part to play. And therefore litigation is not something just because you're feeling it's slow and doesn't achieve the big hit that you, shouldn't, uh, that you should forsake. Everyone does their part and if they're thinking that it can achieve an end, they're more than likely right. So then the next question is, are you going to narrate your own audible version of this book? No, I don't think so. I'll have to get somebody, I don't know, Matt Damon might be good. <laughs> <laughs> he was just in Byron Bay, so I'm sure you could go catch up. Yeah, okay. um, we might go to the floor then if people have questions. And then in 2015, you were, you were writing this book, and um, one would have thought you might have been harbouring a crystal ball at the time with you know what's been what's now happened and how unlikely that was, um, but you know it seems the electorate had some influence in pushing uh, the government to this point, and now they're looking at an electoral disaster really from everything coming out of this and the fact that they were resisting it and all of the comments on the record as to why we don't need a banking royal commission and then all of a sudden it's just like what I mean things were much worse than anyone could have imagined in some ways. Um, have you got any other kind of insights that you've had from interviews you've done or, or, or how you've been approached as to how this thing's all going to play out and is it going to, you know, is, are we going to see a Royal Commission be extended and extended and it really dig deeper or is it going to kind of do a, a bit more of a superficial flush out and then... That's a huge question. I know everyone's very interesting to go, so I'll be brief and I would say I think this is going to have more impact on the way banks operate, certainly within Australia, than the global financial crisis did. Uh, because I think it is in a digestible form for the electorate. The global financial crisis was not. Mm. Talking about bailouts of $1.9 trillion, I mean, who can, who even knows how many zeros are in $1.9 trillion, trillion? Whereas when you're talking about the examples of the nurse, about little businesses being screwed, uh, about banks, um, being involved in giving advice for no, uh, paying, sorry, uh, asking people to pay for no advice, billing the debt, all those sorts of things are very relatable. So I genuinely think that this will have the best shot at changing culture within banking. I don't think we're going to see it soon, and I don't think it's going to be easy, but I would suggest that our children may see a different, different banking system uh, than we have at the moment. Excellent. And just one last thing. Um, and I've got a cunning, cheeky smile on my face because David knows that I'm a kind of flamboyant slam pole in my other life. And um, I um, want to mix this up a little bit. So this is the finish the rap section of the uh, interview. It's a very serious part of the interview. And I, um, and, and the reason, I mean, you're at fault for this because you illustriously quote the Bard at the top of page 77 of your book. Uh, it's uh, T77 lines 8 to 11 for those who like transcript references. And I thought that we might mix it up with a bit of hip hop modernity, put you on the spot, keep things interesting, we'll see what happens. No pressure on you, but you'll be judged by future generations on this. And um, here we go, I just want you to finish the rap. <laughs> he's the, he's the hero. So, it, it, so if people can give me a bit of a clap to kind of. 
Yeah, they're drilling for oil, for up filling their greed, they're killing us all when they're killing the state of the sea. Milling for wood chips and big bank billing for fees. They're, yeah, they're killing us all when they're <laughs> absent. <laughs> yeah, well, that works. Please give a huge hand, David.